Great. Well, w welcome everybody. I see the numbers are creeping up a bit, so we may have a few more join. So today's uh, present presentation is uh, is is biochemistry of, biochemistry of malting. It's a it's a great topic. It's a it's a it's a, it's a topic I've uh, been involved with for pretty much all all of my career. Uh, so I'm going to introduce Dave, Dave Griggs. Now, Dave, Dave is technical director at Chris Malt, and from what I can see, he's been at Chris Malt for nearly ten years now, and worked in the malting industry pretty much all of his all of his career. So he has many responsibilities with malt, including variety testing, technical projects, barley and malt quality control, customer technical support. Uh, and so on. There isn't much. There, there aren't many areas of the malting industry that Dave hasn't uh, worked in. Dave's also an, an IB, IBD diploma brewer, a, a maltsters association master maltster, which is the highest accolade you can obtain in the malting uh, exams. He chairs or has chaired the UK Malting Barley Committee, and as a malting diploma examiner, and as author of many many technical malt, malting articles. So. A very very knowledgeable. So I'm going to hand over to Dave, and I would say if anybody has any questions, to put them in the chat, or if they occur to you as we're going through the discussion, to to use your sort of a virtual hand to raise to raise a point or to ask a question. So over to you, Dave. Julian, thank you very much. Thank you for the kind introduction. Welcome everybody to uh, to the seminar. This afternoon, thanks again to to IBH for allowing me to uh, this opportunity to to speak. So the first thing I need to try and do, although I'm the technical director, I might not be the most technical person. I need to share a screen. I need to share that one. Okay, that looks like it's been successful, and I just need to find another screen. That one there for me. Right. Hopefully everyone can see what I can what I can see, and we will make a start. So, uh, yes, yeah, so I'm going to talk today about biochemistry of malting. Uh, once upon a time, I would have considered myself a, a plant biochemist. Uh, it's been quite a long time since I've done much plant biochemistry, but the whole of our process is really driven by by biochemistry. So I'm going to spend today talking a little bit about some of the uh, the biochemistry of the of, of what's going on, what's 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 generating the change from barley into malt. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, the, what's happening in the different stages of the process with regard to to to, uh, to biochemistry. Uh, look at some of the enzymes uh, and some of the enzyme activities and the role not only that they play during malting, but also the role that they play once that malt gets into our customers' processes. So be they uh, they brewers brewers or distillers. Now, I think it's worthwhile. I know Julian spoke a, a couple of seminars ago a little bit about malting, and I indeed myself spoke about malting last year, but I think it's worthwhile just reminding ourselves what this process is that we're talking about. Well, it's partial germination of cereals, uh, predominantly barley, but also wheat, rye, oats, and other, other cereals such as sorghum, triticale, uh, can also be turned from raw cereal into a malted version of that cereal. And we do that by processing the grain under controlled conditions. And the conditions that we can manage is the moisture at which we keep the grain, uh, the temperature that we keep the grain at, and also the duration that we allow processes to, to proceed for. So in doing this process, we produce a raw material which is then suitable for further processing. So obviously brewing and distilling, big users, but also the food industry uh, are using malted cereals in, in some of their preparations. Uh, and the process of malting kind of unlocks the value of the cereal. So uh, in doing this, this process, we are, we are, we're, we're making extract bit of a nebulous term, but uh, extract is key to, to alcohol yield. Uh, we're, we're, we're producing and releasing enzymes, and then we've got colour and flavour formation uh, and other attributes are coming through which don't exist in the raw cereal, but do exist once we've gone through this malting, malting process. So 
In terms of, of what we're doing, so we're taking, let's talk about barley. Barley is obviously the predominantly malted cereal. We were, we're with the International Barley Hub, so let's stick with barley. Uh, we're taking our raw barley. We're putting it through a steeping process to allow it to absorb moisture and to allow the germination process to initiate. We're then going through uh, germination. So we've got uh, you know, some, some vegetative growth of the grain. We've got roots and shoot formation. And then finally, to fix the quality of the malt that we've produced, we will dry that grain back down again in the kilning process. So some uh, seven days uh, to, get to, to get from barley into malt, a couple of days to do the steeping, uh, typically four days for germination, and then uh, another day to do the kilning process. And at all of these stages, there are biochemical and some chemical processes uh, taking place, and we'll touch on those as we proceed further into the presentation. So we take a little bit of a look at these uh, in each in each case. Uh, look a little bit at the steaming, at the steeping process to start with. Uh, what are we trying to do? Well, we're we looking to hydrate the grain. We're looking to increase the moisture content. So we would dry the grain after harvest for safe storage, and then we're looking to increase that moisture content up to around the mid 45%. The actual percentage would depend on the type of malt that we're looking to produce. But equally, we want to initiate a uniform germination. So barley is not aquatic. It doesn't really want to be underwater for long periods of time. So we have to be very careful. We need to be very careful as to how we go about this process in order that we don't, uh, we don't drown the grain and it comes out of our steeping process in, in good order and is ready for the next stage of, of germination. So typically we would do this broken steeping process whereby the grain is underwater for a period of time, the water is drained, and then uh, it sits with air being drawn through the, through the grain, and then the water is, is replaced for a second time, and then a, a second period of what is described as an air rest and then conceivably we could even go to a third period of water in order to achieve our target moisture content. So once the grain is at the end of steeping, it's, it's quite actively germinating. We need to consider its needs for germination. And this is really the heart of the process where we are converting our, our, our barley into, into malt. Uh, and this is where we're getting the synthesis and release of enzymes, the degradation of of leading to the degradation of endosperm cell walls and the solubilization of some of the storage protein within which the starch granules are embedded uh, within the endosperm. So we talk a lot about modification of the grain and we'll talk about this uh, as we proceed through the, through the presentation. So a number of enzyme, uh, active enzymes are involved in this process of modifying the endosperm. It's that process which really renders a material, a raw cereal, which really isn't suitable uh, for brewing and distilling into a, into a very eminently suitable material through this, this predominantly the modification of the endosperm. So during germination, uh, we are controlling the grain temperature and we're doing that by applying a temperatures and humidified air to the grain bed uh, and that allows us to manipulate the grain temperature and we know that by changing that temperature we can we can divert some of the metabolic activity in particular directions uh, and, we, and that allows us to produce particular types of malt which might be more suitable for for example Pilsen malt brewing or might be more suitable as a high diastatic malt for use in in grain distilling. So we talked about partial germination on the very first slide. We don't want germination to proceed uh, too much, too extensively. So in order to halt the germination, in order to fix our quality, then we will dry the grain. So we're taking the moisture back out of the grain. Uh, so at the end of germination, we could be at 41, 42% moisture, and we'll reduce that moisture down to 3 to 6%. 
uh, depending on the type of malt that we're making. And obviously here we're now into quite significant temperatures, drying processes, and we've got some chemistry happening in here uh, in terms of the Maillard reaction, and we'll look a little bit more on that later on. And it's that Maillard reaction in the latter stages of kilning which allows the development of colour and also the development of flavour attributes. So it's quite simple to do kilning, relatively so. You're just putting hot air through the grain bed, a little bit more complicated than that, quite a high energy process. Uh, so we need ways of, of preserving energy and reusing energy on the kiln. Uh, so it's quite, uh, it's quite a closely controlled process, but also the process that is quite the best modelled, perhaps, part of the malting process. A lot of physics of drying involved in this process so we can understand what's happening to the grain uh, during this, this drying process. As I said, what the, the, and the air temperatures that we use will really be dictated by the type of malt. We're going to talk later on a lot about enzymes. Enzymes are clearly very sensitive to temperature. So if we're looking to produce a malt with a very high enzymic content, again, referring back to, to high diastatic, high enzyme malt for grain distilling, well, that will be dried at a lower air temperature than, for example, the, the, the malt that might go into traditional UK owl production, where we're looking to put more colour into the grain. Uh, but the consequence of more colour and lower moisture is more enzyme destruction because of the, the higher temperatures which are being, being used. So we're going to play a bit of a game now. This is a bit difficult when we're doing it online. Now, what I do when I'm doing this lecture in person, I normally ask people who stand at the back of the room, the ones that haven't come and sat at the front of the room, whether they can spot the difference between these two, uh, these two pictures. Now, we, it's probably a bit difficult to play the game today, uh, but we'll, we'll, have a, we'll have a look at the pictures. So, a picture on the left and a picture on the right. So, I can see probably one person on my screen that would probably be able to spot that, that difference from many years of experience. Uh, but to put you out of your misery of trying to, uh, to see spot the differences, well, it's barley on the left and it's malt on the right. So superficially, uh, not a great deal of difference. So we take grain into our process and grain comes out the other end of our process. If you look closely, between the two pictures, you might see that the malt, some of the husk, is a little bit looser, maybe a little bit uh, broken on one or two, one or two grains. But fundamentally, uh, I'm sure if I walked out into the middle of Norwich and gave a handful of malt to someone, a handful of barley to someone, they wouldn't be able to tell me that, that they were different. So what's happening here? What we're, what are we seeing? What, where are the changes coming from? If we're not seeing uh, sort of struck these these visible changes. But what we're seeing is changes around some of the chemical composition uh, of the grain going from barley into malt. Uh, so this table shows some of the key, uh, the key components of barley and the way in which their percentages changes going, going through the process. So we see a little bit of a reduction in starch. Uh, we see an increase in, in some of the, uh, the simpler sugars in the finished malt. We see a reduction in some of the gum, the gummy material and the, and the hemicellulose. Uh, we see an increase in the, uh, or a decrease rather, in the, the hordenine content. Uh, but also then in, in, on the other flip side of that, we see an increase in the, in the, in the proportion of amino acids and, and polypeptides. So we're seeing some change in, in these components and those changes are what's making this material uh, eminently suitable for the, the further downstream processing. So we said early stage, so steeping, uh, we've got to get germination moving. This process is all about germination. So we put the grain under water, uh, in the steeping tank, the, the embryo imbibes moisture and it hydrates quite rapidly, uh, which is then followed by, by the aluone layer. And that kind of wakes the embryo up. Clearly, it doesn't know it's in a maltings. It, uh, it's just reacting 
to, to moisture absorption. It's obviously hoping at some point it's going to grow up in a Norfolk field and have wonderful sunshine on its back, but sadly it's destined to spend its life, its short life, in a, in a fairly dark malting plant uh, as well, so to come out, but, to, but for perhaps for a more noble process in the fullness of time, because it's going to become uh, uh, beer and whiskey. So, uh, so the embryo's got a little bit of nutrient within it, so it's got a little bit of simple sugars, a little bit of lipids, but that's quite quickly degraded. Obviously, it's, it's metabolizing, it needs to fuel that metabolism, so it's using up its initial uh, reserves. And then it starts to look outside of the embryo as to where is it going to get the necessary nutrition to fuel the development of, of roots and shoots. And it, in order to do that, it needs to start looking at the endosperm and it needs to start the processes of endosperm degradation. So I'm not going to get into an argument here about where the scutellum and the aleurone relationship lies, because I can see a gentleman on my screen who is better qualified uh, to comment on, on that. Uh, but there's a question mark there. Is this scutellum involved in, in the early secretion of, of enzymes in germination? But the embryo is now looking to send out chemical messengers to kickstart metabolic processes outside of the embryo. So it does that by the synthesis and release of, of gibberellins. Now, my PhD was in gibberellin biochemistry way, 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 way back in the dawn of time. Uh, and I think when I was doing my PhD, I think we discovered about 80 gibberellins. I think we're now up to about 140 gibberellins. Uh, but only some of them play an active role in this process of, uh, of triggering metabolic activity. So gibberellin A1 is predominant. Uh, some levels are endogenous levels of gibberellin a3 and also gibberellin A4. So you can see they're all very closely uh, connected in terms of their molecular structure. So these are, they would have been referred to as plant hormones back in the day. They're plant growth regulators uh, and they're playing a role not only in, in germination but also through all of plant development, uh, stem elongation once, once the crop starts to grow into the field as well, so an important group of, of compounds. So as we've said, germination results in endosperm modification. So if we look at barley, this is the barley endosperm under a scanning electron microscope. We can see what is quite a hard, uh, compacted structure. We've got some starch granules visible, uh, but a lot of starch granules are embedded in, in the protein matrix, the hordine storage protein. We can see cell walls where the fracturing has happened uh, for the electron micrograph. So this is a material which is difficult to access the starch in. Uh, there's little starch degrading enzyme activity uh, and you would struggle uh, to get much extract and much, much fermentable material out of raw barley. Once we've gone through the malting process, once we've gone through germination, we've gone through modification, we see quite a, a, a dramatic change in the, in the endosperm structure. So here again is the endosperm. Uh, it's hard to make out individual cells now. We've broken down cell walls. Uh, we've lost a large proportion of the hoarding storage proteins and now the starch granules are visible and accessible. So at the end of the process, we're going to hand over to the brewer and distiller a package of what is now accessible starch and the necessary enzymes that will then break that starch down in the brew house uh, to, to liberate a high level of fermentable sugars, plus a number of the other uh, compounds which are going to be required by the yeast for successful fermentation, so a, a range of nitrogenous, nitrogenous compounds. So now we have a more, a more usable raw material. So what we're going to do now is just going to drill down a little bit into some more of the, some more of the detail here. So uh, the modification of the endosperm cell structure is, is paramount in, in malting. Uh, so we can envisage the, the, gra the, the, the starch granules embedded in the protein matrix. We've got large granules and small starch granules, and we'll come on to those a little bit a little bit later on 
they're embedded in this uh, the, the the protein matrix, and this is all surrounded then by a cell wall uh, composed of, of beta glucan, but also composed of uh, avobenzoylans or pentazan, uh, with, an, with an, an element of protein within those cell walls. And we'll look a little bit further on as to the role of the protein. And those cells are connected through by, by, by channels known as plasmodesmata. So if we zoom in a little bit on, on, on barley, then looking, looking from the, the right hand side of the left uh, of the slide on the left, we can see the husk, we can see the aluron layer which is going to be the, uh, the hub of much of the metabolic activity, which is going to happen through germination. And then we come further into the endosperm, which we've seen in, in more detail previously. And again, on the slide on the right, picture on the right, we can see some uh, evidence of starch granules, small granules and large granules. Uh, we can see the, the protein in which the, the granules are embedded and also cell wall material. And the starch granules have this crystalline structure uh, laid down by layers of starch, and we'll, we'll come on to, to start starch structure shortly. So cell wall degradation is, is really important. This is one of our major tasks. Maybe we shouldn't be monsters. We should be known as cell wall degraders uh, because this is really what we've got to achieve. So this is a, another section of barley. Uh, we can see the husk on the left, followed by the aluron layer, followed by the endosperm, and with, this has been stained with a compound called calcofluor, uh, and under a UV light, we get enhanced fluorescence of, of the calcofluor once it's bonded to beta-glucan, and here we're seeing the cell walls being highlighted by, uh, by this, this process. So we can see uh, the, 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 quite the job to be done. So in terms of composition, then those cell walls are in barley predominantly made up of beta-glucan, some 70% uh, by weight would be beta-glucan, around about 20% would be arabinozylan, then with some protein uh, in place and also some other smaller uh, hemicelluloses such as cellulose and, and glucomannan. So here's our structure of, of beta-glucan, so it's a polymer of, of, of glucose uh, and the, those glucose uh, those individual glucose moieties could be joined through either an alpha-1-3 or an alpha-1-4 bond. And it's the breaking of those, uh, those bonds between the individual glucose units which is required to ultimately reduce our beta-glucan content within the grain to a level which is manageable uh, within the brewery and the, and the distillery. So... In terms of beta-glucan, then we need to degrade those, those cell walls, which we've spoken about, and that's going to open up the cells, giving access to the protein and ultimately the starch degrading, the protein degrading and ultimately the starch degrading enzymes. So why do we need to break down beta-glucan? Well, you saw a very small amount of beta-glucan on the previous slide, but it's a humongous molecule, a uh, very branched molecule. It gives massive viscosity issues uh, if it gets extracted in the brew house. Uh, so we need to degrade that away to prevent downstream issues uh, and, and to ensure that we provide our customers with the, the right quality of malt for their processes. So we see a decline in beta-glucan from barley, around about four, 3 to 4% of the weight of raw barley is beta-glucan. And if we're doing our job correctly, then we should be down to under, let's say, under half a percent by weight uh, in the final malt which, uh, which we have produced. And this degradation of, 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 of beta-glucan, of the cell walls, is, is taken to occur in a biphasic nature. So the first stage of this process is the loosening of the structure by an enzyme called beta-glucan solubilase. Now this is a, a, a carboxypeptidase and that's acting on the protein crosslink. So if you can imagine the cell walls look a little bit like a fence. We've got, uh, we've got linear polymers of, uh, of, of, of the beta-glucan crosslinked by protein and the first action is for those crosslinks to be, to be broken which is then followed up by the action of 
endo-1314 beta-glucanases which come along and start chewing up the bonds between the, the glucose units, reducing the length of the polymers and ultimately they can reduce those polymers down to individual glucose units and which again will find their way back to the embryo to sustain embryo nutrition. So two, two enzyme activities are required and the interesting thing is that the, the early stage at the first step when we've got solubilase activity then the release of these long chains this these are the these are the the villains of the piece these are the chains which cause you the big viscosity issues and then subsequent breakdown by the gluconases start to start to reduce that problem of, of high molecular weight beta glucan uh, in solution so beta glucan causes viscosity issues and if we choose to measure that viscosity during malting then we see uh, some quite interesting changes and this is using a rapid visco analyzer so a pasting process to uh, uh, to assess uh, viscosity uh, and what we see is from raw barley to the to maybe six hours into steeping as the grain starts to wake up we start to see an increase in in viscosity and this is the release or the initiation of the release of those high molecular weight chains by beta glucan solubilase and then as we proceed through steeping germination is already starting in steeping and into germination we see a progressive decline in viscosity which is reflecting the decline in the beta glucan content of the grain so what do we know about beta glucan solubilase? Uh, well, it's a carboxy has carboxy peptidase like activity. It's there already in the grain. So all the solubilase we're going to see has been laid down during uh, grain fill and maturation of the grain, and it's it's then becoming active as we move into germination. So it brings beta glucan into solution. And what is of particular significance to beta glucan solubilase that it is relatively heat resistant so it can have activity when we get through to the mashing stage of of brewing and and distilling and there is a risk if all of the beta glucan has not been degraded during malting that beta glucan solubilase could bring high molecular weight beta glucan into solution <laughs> Okay, so so we've got our long chains there, our high molecular weight beta glucan released. Now we need to break that down. So we need beta gluconase enzymes. So there are no beta gluconase enzymes in mature barley. All these enzymes are synthesized and released from the aluone layer during germination. Very much dependent on 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 gibberellic acid. So the gibberellins play quite a role here in in promoting beta gluconase activity it's an endo enzyme so it's chopping within the chains we've seen the one three one four linkages uh, which are being attacked so it can hydrolyze one four links adjacent to one three linkages and it comes in two types quite quite uh, sensibly called enzyme one and enzyme two which have got slightly differing activities and slightly different uh, heat sensitivities as well. So that's the significance of beta gluconase. It is extremely heat labile. So we've seen at the end of our process we undergo the drying stage on the kiln, and during that stage we lose most of the beta gluconase enzyme activity, which we have been, which we have produced during germination. So we cannot rely on further beta gluconase activity in the brewery or the distillery so it's very much beholden on the maltster to make the best use of the beta gluconase activity which is generated uh, during our process to do this task of beta glucan degradation the other the second biggest component of the cell walls is the rabinoxylan uh, so maybe up to 20 percent of the cell wall structure quite similar to beta glucan similar properties so again a high viscosity 
uh, compound in solution. It's degraded by uh, one uh, endoxylanases, so endo one four beta xylanases. Again, GA dependent, synthesized in the alurone, but a little bit later in germination than uh, than some of the other enzymes. So uh, their activity may not be fully exploited during uh, the four or five days of germination, which would be typical in a, in a modern malting plant. It's possible that they've been underestimated. These could be a bigger cause of viscosity issues, runoff issues in the in the brewery and the and the distillery. So there's still work to be done on on really understanding the role of of arabinoxylans and the enzyme uh, the enzymes involved in their breakdown. So we've talked about the outside. What we've talked about the cell wall. So going into those cells, then. Uh, we saw that the starch granules were, were embedded in protein. So if we stain our section of grain, our section of barley with a protein stain, again, we've got the husk on the far left. Then we find the alurone layer very densely staining. So this is where a lot of the, the metabolic machinery is located, which is, which is synthesizing enzymes. And then we come into the alurone layer, uh, higher levels of protein in the subalurone and we can see starch granules embedded in this blue background of protein. So we need to degrade uh, some of this protein as well through, through germination. So a lot of enzymes involved in, in this process and possibly the least well characterized uh, enzymatic process uh, that's going on uh, through germination. So. The storage protein, the hoarding, is being degraded, being, being solubilized, not disappearing, just being solubilized uh, with a number of enzymes involved in this, in this process. So endopeptidases with different dependencies, uh, metal dependent, for example, uh, releasing peptide chains from proteins. Exopeptidases chopping in from the end of, uh, of peptide chains, which giving a smaller peptide and individual amino acids and then uh, then other enzymes which can work from the termini the amino or carboxy termini of peptides producing producing amino acids so this is an important part of the process uh, these peptides and amino acids are going to contribute to yeast nutrition and sustaining yeast during fermentation uh, the solubilization of proteins will give us uh, head retention so there's an attribute factor here. So everybody likes to see a, uh, a beer with a head on, on it, and that's being stabilized by a number of the proteins which are being uh, solubilized through this, through this process. So overall, uh, some 35 to 40% of the protein is solubilized during, during malting. And it's this uh, solubilization which gives us one of our measures of modification, which is the ratio of the total protein content of the grain to the amount which has been solubilized. So uh, it's either referred to as the soluble nitrogen ratio uh, using the Institute of Brewing System of Analysis or Colback Index uh, with the European system, the EBC system, or even S over T, soluble over total. Uh, in the US. So quite an important measure of quality. Uh, and then some of this nitrogenous or protein material is, is, is degraded through to peptides and free amino acids. And this is what we measure as free amino nitrogen content of the grain. Again, important for many malt types, particularly if the brewer or the distiller is using a proportion of unmalted material then the malt has to provide a higher proportion or higher amount of free amino nitrogen in order to ensure that there is sufficient for successful fermentation. Some brewing methods will generate a little bit more free amino nitrogen, uh, depending on the temperature at which uh, the mashing process is carried out, but somewhere in the region of 40 to 70 percent of those final amino acids which will be in the wort, which the yeast will see, have come from the the molten form germination. So 
in going through this process, we've we've already seen the the, the structural or the endosperm structural changes uh, going going through this process. So uh, here is molt again. Uh, we can see the husk in the bottom left hand corner, then the alluone layer, and then coming in to see in the starch granule. So not a lot of protein there. Uh, certainly not a lot of cell wall material. Uh, second slide here, we've still got a little bit of cell wall material. Uh, this wouldn't be a crisp malt. Uh, we would never have any cell wall material remaining in any of our malts. So, uh, uh, so a little bit of cell wall material, a little bit of protein as well. Uh, it's about a good, nice, open, loose structure. Now we've got a material which has gone from being hard, difficult to mill, to a material which is easily crushable. So it can be crushed in the in the in the in the mill in the brew. It can liberate starch, and then uh, once we get into mashing process, then uh, it's easy for those those starch degrading enzymes to access the uh, the, the granules. Uh, if we zoom in onto the granules themselves, here we can see that there's some pitting of these granules. So starch in starch granule breakdown has started, and we do see the loss of some starch granules during germination and we'll come come on to that uh, in a couple of slides time down here you can just about see at the bottom again the crystalline structure of the of the starch within the within the granule so if we've been successful uh, this is what the endosperm looks like at the end of the end of germination and everything everything has been done has been done well so Starch, obviously, very important uh, for the subsequent stages that the malt is going to go through. This is where the simple sugars are going to come from, which are going to get fermented uh, by the yeast and, and ultimately turn into, into alcohol. And we've seen in some of those electron micrographs that we've got two different types of, of granules, which are imaginatively referred to as large granules and small granules. Uh, so the large granules are significantly larger than the small granules uh, and they make up uh, the, the, the larger proportion of the weight. Uh, but interestingly, they only make up 10% of the actual number of starch granules. So the small granules are in the predominant uh, granules and it's these small granules which tend to be preferentially degraded during the early stages of germination. And we're quite happy with that uh, because they are they are a small proportion of the starch weight. Uh, but what is quite significant about the starch granules is that they have a higher temperature for this process described as gelatinization. So when we get into the into mashing, uh, it's necessary for the starch granules to undergo gelatinization before. Uh, they can start to undergo enzyme degradation. And gelatinization uh, is, is, is the process of imbibition of water by the starch granules or warm water, which leads to disruption of structure, uh, which then allows access of the starch degrading enzymes to start breaking down the components of the, of the starch. And bear those temperatures in mind, because we'll see them again a little bit later on, because they have... Uh, direct implication for the mashing stage in the in the distillery or the, or the brewery. So let's look a little bit at starch. How what's its composition? Well, it's made up of two different types of of glucose polymers. Uh, we've got the linear amylose, where the glucose units are joined through the alpha one four bond, and then we have the more highly branched a myelopectin structure, where not only do we have linear chains with the alpha-1-4 bond, but those chains are cross-linked through uh, an alpha-1-6 bond. Uh, and this this alpha-1-6 bond is quite significant to the process of how the starch is degraded and how those glucose uh, and the smaller sugars arise through starch degradation. So if you remember back to, to back to one of the early the early slides, uh, I said that we're looking to provide the, the brewer and the distiller with accessible starch and the enzymes necessary to to degrade it. 
Uh, if you look in any popular brewing textbook, there'll be about 800 pages on brewing, one paragraph on malting, and they'll always say uh, the maltster breaks the starch down. Well, the maltster isn't attempting to break the starch down. That's the, the brewer and the distiller's job. We're looking to generate the enzymes that will ultimately break the starch down uh, in the mashing stage of, of brewing and, and distilling. So there's a range of starch degrading enzyme activities which are required. So alpha amylase, I'm sure everyone's familiar with that, pretty much ubiquitous through nature as a starch degrading enzyme. Uh, beta amylase, limit dextranase, and, and to a lesser extent the enzyme alpha glucosidase or maltase. And these, all these enzymes play a different role in the breakdown of, of, of amylo, amylose and amylopectin. So we'll talk a little bit about the individual enzymes on the, on the following slides. Uh, but the ultimate uh, reduction of amylose is to, is to maltose, the two glucose sugars, or to, even to glucose through the action of, of alpha-glucosidase. Uh, but we get this breakdown process whereby we get shorter polymers uh, through the action of the different enzymes and we would be looking to maximize uh, maltose production that's the most fermentable of the uh, of the smaller pep of smaller uh, polysaccharides and particular malt types we would be we'd be looking to tailor our process in order to maximize for example beta amylase activity in order that we can then ensure uh, a maximum yield of maltose when the starch is broken down. So if we consider amylase, alpha amylase to start with, uh, there's a little bit of alpha amylase in the mature grain uh, or during, German, uh, during grain field, but it's virtually all gone by the time the grain is mature and harvested. So it's produced during germination, uh, maybe some from the scutellum, uh, majority from the alirone layer, again, with a GA dependency here. So uh, gibberellic acid will enhance alpha amylase levels. Quite heat stable, and this has some significance once we get on to kilning, uh, that we can actually see, although we're heating the grain during kilning, uh, we can see some enhanced uh, production and activity of alpha amylase. Because alpha amylase can hydrolyze some of the intact starch granules. So where we're seeing small starch granule disappearance, during germination, then alpha amylase will play a role in that. Uh, and we know that the smaller granules are attacked at a faster rate uh, by this limited enzyme activity during germination. As we said, into mashing, we need to gelatinize those granules, uh, and that's when the large granules get attacked. Uh, alpha amylase uh, is an exo uh, endoenzyme, so it's, it can't hydrolyze terminal uh, linkages and it can't hydrolyze the branch point uh, of, uh, of amylopectin. So we're already starting to see that alpha amylase will give us a bit of a mixed bag of different chain length uh, polysaccharides as, it's, as, a, as the nature of its activity. What it does do, uh, if you throw alpha amylase into a starch solution, it does give quite a rapid reduction in, in viscosity uh, of that starch. So it's good for uh, you know, for managing mash viscosity. And you measure uh, the activity of alpha amylase through the classic iodine staining uh, technique where, where intact starch will stain purple. Uh, the hydrolyzed starch loses that staining power. Uh, and most uh, brewers and distillers will use that uh, test uh, to assess the performance of mashing to ensure that they are getting good starch breakdown and good scarification through the activity of alpha amylase. And it produces this mixture of oligosaccharides. Uh, so on its own, we wouldn't get a high yield of maltose. Uh, we would get a mixture of, of different, different, uh, uh, different sugar, chain length sugars. So beta amylase, the second enzyme, uh, present in the mature grain at harvest. So this has been laid down in the grain uh, as the grain matures pre-harvest present in two forms a form which is active and a form which is bound and inactive 
uh, and through the processes of of germination the inactive bound form is released uh, and becomes active as is, and is available for for subsequent starch degradation so it's liberated by by or taken to be liberated by proteases uh, enzymes during during germination and it is heat labile so again this is another enzyme where we see loss of enzyme activity through kilning and we need to be careful <coughs> on our drying process particularly for most where we were looking to have a very high uh, enzyme activity such as high dp Malts of grain distilling. So it's got no activity against the intact starch granules, and significantly, it's an exoenzyme. <coughs> Excuse me. So it chews in from the ends of the amylose chains, taking off every other bond, so liberating high, high yield of the two glucose sugar maltose. But once it gets to the alpha 1 6 linkages on a myelopectin, it gets a bit stuck can't go any further so it produces maltose and beta limit dextrins uh, these dextrins then being uh, the feedstock for a second of uh, a third enzyme so beta amylase gives us a relatively slow reduction in viscosity of starch solutions because of these dextrins which are produced uh, we say so it's producing maltose and beta limit dextrins so somehow we need to deal with these beta limit dextrins if we're going to get a good uh, yield of fermentable sugars. And thankfully, the creator of barley gave us another enzyme, limit dextrinase. Uh, there's small amounts in, in barley, both free and bound. Uh, we get four more production during germination. Again, a heat labile enzyme, so we'll lose limit dextrinase activity on, on kilning but it can break down those alpha 1 6 linkages between the uh, between the polymers of our of a myelopectin uh, which then releases further substrate for alpha and beta amylase to act upon so it would be described as a debranching enzyme because it debranches the uh, the structure of a myelopectin but again is unable to attack intact starch so we, so we still need that gelatinization uh, uh, to, to occur and theory says that up to 20% of the amylopectin uh, could be unfermentable without limit limit dextrinase uh, so we do a limited amount of limit dextrinase analysis uh, for certain certain malt types uh, but it's not that it's not, I guess it would be not that well characterized within the assessment of malt malt quality our fourth enzyme was was alpha glucosidase. So this has the capability to reduce to release glucose from maltose and, and small dextrins. Uh, there's a little bit in the mature barley. Uh, there's some synthesis uh, during germination. Again, GA dependent enzyme, uh, and evidence to suggest it may initiate some of that starch granule break, and it may be boring those holes that we saw in the starch granules in the electron micrograph earlier on one of the other components of of barley which we haven't yet considered is lipid material so uh, likely to provide some energy for early germination lipid within the within the embryo uh, and then a number of lipid degrading enzymes are formed during germination so there's about three percent by weight of lipid uh, formed <coughs> And these enzymes uh, release fatty acids. Lipase enzymes release fatty acids from, from lipids. And then potentially these fatty acids can be oxidized by uh, the enzyme group like poxygenase. So if anybody's been around a malting and you pick up that cucumbery aroma, uh, that's lipid uh, degradation uh, that's going on during, during germination. But the danger is that some of those uh, fatty acids, if they undergo oxidation by lipoxygenase, they can then become beer staling compounds. So, look a little bit at the pathways involved here. So, we've got malt lipids being degraded to, uh, to fatty acids, so linoleic acid being an example of that. 
And then a couple of enzymes, uh, LOX1 and LOX2, uh, which then uh, further degrade the, uh, the fatty acids. And ultimately, uh, we could end up with uh, the production of this compound, trans 2 noninal, uh, which if you ever drink a pint of beer and it's got a wet cardboard flavour, don't let the brewer try and convince you it's meant to taste like that. This is, uh, this is trans 2 noninal. You're getting that, uh, that, that rather unpleasant aroma coming through in the beer. Now, uh, there's been a lot of activity uh, <coughs> to understand the control of these lipoxygenase uh, enzymes. So kilning cycles, they're quite heat labile. So kilning cycles can be used uh, in order to, to limit lipoxygenase activity in the malt, which will then go into the brew house. However, uh, we now have available to us barley varieties which have been specifically bred to eliminate uh, these two enzymes. So there are null LOX varieties. These have come out of the, the Carlsberg Research Laboratory, uh, initially in association with Heineken. Uh, we have LOX less varieties, which have come out of Japan uh, from Sapporo. And uh, so there's a lot of interest in, in now these, these varieties being used uh, within within the brewing process in order to uh, enhance shelf life and to reduce the risk of, of staling compounds uh, being formed in your in your beer, particularly an issue with some of the paler Pilsner star style of beers. So uh, so a, a, a quite quite a development within within barley breeding. Not genetically manipulated, uh, all by selection uh, to, to achieve these null LOX varieties. So we spoke earlier on about uh, the requirement for, for gibberellins and their role that, that in this process. Uh, well, a number of enzymes are quite sensitive to, to gibberellins and, uh, and gibberellic acid, and the monster will use gibberellic acid. We can apply exogenous uh, GA3, gibberellin A3, to grain in certain circumstances uh, where the customer would permit that. There are certain uh, malt types where it is not permitted. So, for example, on distilling malt, uh, it's not permitted, uh, and it's not permitted for any malt that might be used in a brewery which complies with the Reinheitsgebot, the German uh, beer purity law. But we do see uh, an enhancement of, of enzyme activity through uh, the application of, of, of gibberellic acid. Modern varieties uh, require much less uh, Act, uh, exogenous gibberellins to be to be applied. Uh, the breeding process has, has, has driven us into this uh, uh, into this place, which is a good one, good place to be. Uh, but we do see we do see some benefits to to overall quality. So we mentioned we spoke earlier on about modification, and the malt is obsessed with modification. So we go around each day. Uh, ripping the ends off of grain, squeezing the endosperm out and rubbing it between our fingers. We all end up with white hands every day to assess how well modified the endosperm is. If it's modified, we get this white streak on our fingers of where we can, where we really just smoothing out the starch. Uh, the starch is accessible. So that modification has, de has degraded cell walls. Uh, and in terms of some of our quality uh, factors, things that we would measure, so this degradation is improving our friability of the grain. It's decreasing the word viscosity. Uh, it's removing beta-glucan and the risks associated with beta-glucan. We've solubilized endosperm proteins. Uh, so this is generating the soluble nitrogen, soluble protein that we need, and also the smaller peptides and amino acids. But also importantly here, a lot of those smaller uh, nitrogenous compounds become precursors for flavour and colour formation when we get through to kilning. And then we're generating, again, starch degrading enzymes for use by the, the, the brewer or the distiller. Uh, and some of those simple sugars which are coming through limited starch degradation equally, again, are also precursors for the, the, for the reactions uh, leading to colour and flavour formation. 
So <clears throat> we've been through germination. We've kind of now set our stall out. We know what the quality is. So we need to fix that quality by, by kilning. Uh, and this is taking the moisture out of the grain. And this really brings a halt to germination. But it doesn't necessarily bring a halt to all of the biochemistry and chemistry that's going on. So in the early stages of kilning, described as the germinative phase or free drying, uh, the air temperature going onto the grain bed is fairly moderate, maybe around 55 degrees centigrade. Because the grain is, is saturated with moisture, then uh, a lot of the energy is taken out of that heat through the uh, latent heat of evaporation as we drive the moisture out. And the grain bed sits at around about 28 degrees centigrade. And what this then gives us is accelerated germination, so more enzyme synthesis, more enzyme activity. So we can see continuation of, of some of the processes which have been occurring through what we would describe as the germination part of the process. Uh, as we take our temperatures up, uh, enzyme activity continues, but now we're in that point of destruction of enzymes due to heat uh, versus formation of enzymes. So at some point, the destruction beats the formation and we start to see some enzyme inactivation and this is where we see the loss of beta gluconase activity the loss of of beta amylase activity so if we're looking to maximize certainly beta amylase activity then we would keep our air temperatures relatively uh, moderate in this second stage we may not exceed uh, 65 degrees centigrade in order to try and preserve enzyme activity. But also here we're starting to see some colour formation. Uh, and it's when we move into the higher final stages of kilning, into the curing phase, where we now start to see Maillard reactions. So the browning, the food browning reaction now starts to starts to occur. We also see reduction in this compound called DMS, which we'll mention uh, a little bit in a couple of slides in a couple of slides time. So still quite a lot of chemistry, biochemistry going on as we drive the moisture out of the grain and get that moisture down to maybe four, three to six percent, uh, which allows the grain to be st stably stored, shipped around the world and then crushed successfully uh, in the brewery or the distillery. So for colour formation, uh, we've got the Maillard reaction uh, coming into play, uh, starting off with simple sugars and amino acids. Uh, going through a number of, of potential steps in order to generate both flavour compounds and also colour compounds. Uh, and we can manipulate this to a degree by the temperatures that we're using on, uh, on the kiln. And we can take it to its fullest extent through the preparation of coloured malt products, where we're actively promoting the formation of reducing sugars and amino acids to then drive us to higher levels of colour and flavour formation. So another potential flavour compound uh, is this compound called dimethyl sulphide. Uh, it's a volatile compound. Uh, it's got a characteristic flavour of cooked vegetables. If you ever open a tin of uh, tinned sweet corn, then you'll get hit with a big wallop of, of dimethyl sulphide. Uh, it's undesirable at higher levels. There are some beers in which uh, a certain amount of dimethyl sulphide is characteristic. Uh, there's a large uh, best-selling uh, English brewed lager, uh, which is quite relatively high in DMS. Uh, but most beers, it's not a desirable attribute. And it's, it's very much associated with paler Pilsner-style beers. Uh, got quite a low flavour threshold. And it arises through this uh, uh, compound called S-methylmethionine, or DMS precursor. So this is formed during germination. Uh, this is involatile. But in the process of kilning, then the higher temperatures lead to thermal uh, degradation of S-methylmethionine uh, and generates dimethyl sulfide. So by kilning, we can effectively blow a lot of the dimethyl sulfide out the top of the kiln uh, in order to ensure that we don't carry that compound through into, into the brewery 
uh, and, and potentially lead to uh, to those un, unpleasant flavours in uh, in finished beer. Another compound that we should really consider uh, from the distiller's point of view is the formation of, of ethyl carbamate. So uh, a little bit wordy here, but ethyl carbamate arises from uh, the compound epihetrodendrin, uh, which is derived from the amino acid leucine uh, via multi-step reaction with these cytochrome, uh, P450 cytochromes involved, uh, which, which glucose which releases the cyanohydrin, which is then gly gly glycosylated to give this compound epihetrodendrin. And this compound can lead ultimately, uh, depending on the conditions of distillation, to the formation of ethyl carbamate or urethane, uh, which is a known carcinogen. This could end up in new make spirit and ultimately in, in mature whiskey. This was identified uh, some time ago by the Scotch Whiskey industry as a risk uh, and now uh, all of the varieties which we are using to make distilling malt both uh, pot still distilling malt and high diastatic distilling malt they are all produced from uh, barley varieties which where the B50 cytochromes uh, have been taken out through the breeding process so uh, we don't have the, the, the metabolic pathway to epihetrodendrin has been disabled uh, and that then uh, reduces or takes away the major risk of the formation of, of ethyl carbamate. Uh, and, and obviously that's a, a food safety improvement in, in, in barley malting and, and then in distillation. Also formed in, in kilning, uh, we have the risk of this compound being formed during the kilning process, N-nitrosodimethylamine. So n nitroso compounds have been identified as potential carcinogens, uh, high concentration in, in cigarette smoke. Uh, and back in the, the 70s, 70s, early 80s, uh, malt was identified as a source of NDMA in, in both beer and whiskey. Uh, and the industry worked hard to understand where uh, the NDMA was arising from and how that NDMA can be controlled. Uh, and it's formed by the reaction of hordenine, so it's a modified amino acid in green malt, and the nitrous oxides in kiln air, where, which are arising from combustion of, uh, of carbon fuels. Uh, so this, uh, this is the passing of the, of the gases of combustion through the grain bed, uh, and this issue has been solved predominantly by moving away from direct fired kilning, to indirect fired kilning, whereby the gases of combustion heat a radiator, uh, and then uh, it's, it's, it's ambient air uh, being drawn across radio, being heated across radiators uh, to, to limit uh, the risk of NDMA formation. Here we're down at, uh, we work to a voluntary limit of five micrograms per kilogram. So it really is, uh, you know, needle in a haystack. Uh, chemistry to ensure that we are complying with with NDMA levels. So that's a little bit about about kilning, and uh, we've made the malt. So we're now going to pass the malt over to the brewer and the distiller. We've already seen that enzymes are sensitive to temperature. Well, the first stage of the brewing and malt, uh, brewing and distilling process requires. Uh, hot water to be used uh, to, to, to carry out this process and we see that alpha amylase and beta amylase have got relatively different optimum temperatures for activity and then, and then also for inactivation. So once we get above a certain temperature we'll start to denature those, those enzymes and, and, and limit, dextrinase, limit dextrinase similarly. And earlier on we saw gelatinization and we can see that there is a relationship here around temperatures of enzyme uh, optimization and inactivation along with the temperature we need to get those starch granules to in order to carry out gelatinization. So we do see, we can measure gelatinization temperature and we do see some changes crop to crop. Um, and if gelatinization temperature gets a little bit too high, then 
there is a risk that we're not going to make maximum activity or maximum use of our enzyme activity. And there is quite a nice uh, graph, uh, which I will give credit to uh, various people for, uh, describing the brewer's window. So this shows the activity of uh, beta amylase, alpha amylase, uh, not quite really overlapping at their peak activities. So beta amylase most active in the low 60s degrees, alpha amylase at the higher level. Uh, and we know that starch granule gelatinization is occurring around 63, 64, maybe 65 degrees. So the brewer has quite a narrow window to work in in order to maximize the, the potential for these enzymes and to maximize the yield of uh, the yield of, uh, of, of, of fermentable, fermentable, fermentable material. But he can also use his mashing temperature to manipulate the composition of his wort. So if he's looking for high maltose, then he would tend to malt at a lower, a lower uh, he would tend to mash at a lower temperature, but he still needs to ensure it's high enough that he's got good starch gelatinization. And similarly, if he's looking for uh, higher levels of dextrin, maybe to build mouthfill into his beer, then he may mash at a higher temperature in order to limit the amount of beta amylase activity. And the distillers are looking to max out uh, maltose, so they really are looking at, at the lowest uh, mashing temperature they can in order to make best use of beta amylase and to get that high level of, of, uh, of, of maltose produced. So I'd like to thank Professor Palmer. I think you may well have, have contributed to that particular particular graph. Thank you, Jeff, for that. Uh, and that just about brings me through to the end of this fairly whirlwind tour through uh, some of the biochemistry of, of the production of, of malt. Uh, I would just like to leave you with one recommended reading. So this is a fairly new book, which has been, uh, which has been uh, published by a good friend of mine, Zhang Yin, who is the technical director at Ra Malt in the US. Very readable, uh, available through the ASBC, the American Society of Brewing Chemists uh, Library. Uh, so a nice, uh, a nice introduction into many aspects of, of malt uh, and some nice sections on, on some of the biochemistry as well. So Julian, that's, that's me done. I've got no idea if anybody's been interested enough to ask any questions. So, if anyone's even still there, I know one person. <laughs> one person's still there. I can see Jeff. <laughs> so. no, no, no. I can reassure you that we have a reasonable number of still. Uh, yeah, I hope they're not not too difficult. I'm going to end my slideshow and come out and uh, come yeah. back to being visible again. So, so thanks very much for that. It's a really, it's a really big topic, and you covered that comprehensively. Uh, so, so comprehensively, in fact, that I haven't seen any questions yet. <laughs> so, um, oh, I just... invite, invite anybody that has a question to come on, uh, raise their hand. Okay, no. Uh, oh, <laughs> no, you can't. <laughs> of course, Jeff. Yeah, of course you can. Uh, can I? Can I? Can you hear me? I can hear you, Jeff. Yeah. Oh, great. Uh, my technology is not very good, so. <laughs> Um, I was having difficulty hearing at first, <laughs> but no, excellent, David. That was um, an, an excellent lecture. In fact, I think every young brewer, distiller, or molster should should get a copy. I think you should you should send it around. I'm serious because it covers wow. it very really well. Only and picking up on much of your work, Jeff. So it's all Pardon? credit to you. It's all credit to you. Some of that. So uh, <laughs> I, I didn't recognise one of my drawings. <laughs> yeah, I you might have done. But uh, no, okay. no, no. I was not, nothing. I think it, um, it, you know, it explains the process very, very well. And and the only reason why I'm speaking, the I've just seen a note on my phone that the government wants me to come and talk about the honours system. <laughs> Having having got a couple of honours, they can... want me to come at three fifteen <laughs> to talk about the honours system. So you're eminently so qualified have on to that, run Jeff. off. So I'm not leaving because of the lecture. No, for those of those of you who don't know Jeff, Jeff Professor Jeff Palmer, uh, I, I think I'm right. In, I think I'm, it's only fair to say globally renowned 
for his his research work with into malting and malting malting barley's. So Jeff was for many years at the uh, International Centre for Brewing and Distilling at, at Heriot Watt, uh, still emeritus professor, I believe. Uh, so I could so I could have should, should of course say Sir Jeff uh, Palmer. So I've been I've just been a very good friend to the to the brewing malting brewing and distilling industries over very many years. Yeah, thank yeah, you so much. <laughs> yeah, we've got the questions coming through now. So I'm going to uh, I'm first going to go to the a couple of questions that have come online here, the, uh, and I'm going to grab grab them before they disappear off the screen. <laughs> so they've got a question. We've got a question here, which is what about the average amount or the volume of water that you use in the steeping process to 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 get to from sort of barley fourteen percent, say up to you know forty three, forty five percent. Is there a benchmark on the volume of water? Well, obviously we're under pressure for water water usage, uh, and we would really be looking at around about uh, three and a half metric cube per ton of malt produced. But what you've got to remember, of course, is that eighty five percent of the water that comes into the maltings goes out of the maltings as as effluent. Uh, so, I mean, we are still immersing grain in big tanks of water. Uh, I mean, I think there is a case for looking again at spray steeping. Uh, the grain doesn't really want to be underwater where you could trickle water through the system. And there are a number of systems now available for water reuse uh, that, that, that clean the water up and allow it to be put back into the process at an appropriate uh, quality for that, for that steeping process. Yeah. OK, I'm going to go next to a hand that was raised, Dinesh Kumar, and I think you'd like to come on screen. Ask a question. Dinesh. Hello. Hello. Hi, Dinesh. Yeah. This is Dinesh. Hello, David. Uh, Hi. And hello to everyone. Uh, this is Dinesh Kumar from uh, India, uh, Indian Institute of Wheat and Barley Research. And uh, I'm audible, sir. You are. Yeah, we hear loud and clear. You're coming through loud yeah, and clear. Yeah. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot for the wonderful lecture, sir. And uh, actually, uh, uh, now the issue of ethyl carbamate uh, has started coming in our uh, uh, country also. So uh, actually, I was looking about the methods being used for the estimation. So they normally involve uh, um, cyanide compounds, potassium cyanide or other compounds. Uh, so first, uh, my, uh, uh, you can say, guidance from you is any other alternate method is there for the estimation of uh, these things, one thing. Second, is there any uh, correlation between the protein content and the final ethyl carbamate formation? Because as you told that uh, leucine is the precursor. Uh, can we select for the low, I mean, uh, low protein content uh, of early? That's all, David. Yeah. That's good questions, Dinesh. Thank you. Uh, first question: I'm only aware of the the, the single method for for determination of of ethyl carbamate, uh, which is does use cyanide cyanide as the as the uh, the standard to establish the calibration for it. If you'd yeah. like, I'm happy to share the method with you, uh, if that's of that's if that's of use. Uh, the second question around protein content. Well. Of distilling distilling barley's are always of low of low protein. Uh, there is some evidence that, that we you know the ethyl carbamate level can be controlled a little bit by uh, the extent at which modification uh, occurs, uh, but it doesn't reduce it down to a satisfactory level. So it is only through this breeding program which has resulted in the 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 non EC or non GN varieties where we, we are at this stage. Because it's not a problem for all distilleries. There are some exactly. distilleries that can process uh, GN positive uh, barley barley varieties. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very right. much. Thank you. We've got some other questions on the chat. So I've got one here, which is it says, "Thanks, David. Which space of quality have to be improved? And extract enzyme activity, glucan." Arabian as island. So I, I think I think the question is around what what aspects need to be all of those improvement possible. <laughs> all of those. No. Uh, so now I think I think we're almost at a point where uh, we're going to not see significant increases in extract. Uh, and if you look at uh, the way 
if you look at some of the interaction, if you do principal, start again. If you do principal component analysis, looking at the interaction between uh, different parameters of malt, you find that extract really sits slap bang in the middle, and it's the breeders have focused very much on extract over the last hundred years of of plant breeding, uh, and that's really very much because it's an economic parameter, and it's what really drives the brewers to achieve uh, what they're looking to achieve. So I think extract. We're probably not going to see uh, massive improvements. Uh, I think we can always do with a bit more enzyme activity. Uh, and we can certainly do with a bit less beta-glucan. Uh, but there's good reasons why the grain has beta-glucan within it uh, from a structural point of view. Uh, so I think, yeah, a little bit less beta-glucan, please, uh, for the for the plant breeders. And I can see at least one plant breeder uh, on the call. Uh, <laughs> Hello, Dominic. Uh, uh, a little bit more question. enzyme activity uh, would all be would always be good. Always be good. Good. That was Dominic that asked the question. <laughs> Obviously, <laughs> oh, I thought it might have been. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I move. I move to the next question. This is an interesting one. So it's from Luke Ramsey at uh, JHI. So uh, you've got you talked about breeding improvements. So we've got things like nalox, non-GN. So is it where do you think our next improvements in breeding techniques will be? Well, I mean, the interesting thing is not only really now, guys should have mentioned this at the time, not only do we now have null locks and null GM, we've got null DMS. So we've now got varieties which don't produce dimethyl sulfide. Uh, and that has benefits to us in terms of kilning. We don't have to kiln quite so hard to get rid of the DMS. And it has benefits to the brewer that they don't have to boil quite as hard to get rid of DMS in the... Uh, in the uh, in the uh, in the brew house, uh, you know we've also got varieties which don't have any polyphenols, uh, and I think we're getting to a point. I'm not quite sure what what else we can remove, and it's still barley. Uh, at what point it, 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 the plant decides it's not going to going to continue? Uh, I mean, I, I think this comes a little bit back to the question that Dominic asked around where can we see improvements, uh, and I think it is around, I think it's around processability. Uh, and reliability of processability, but I think also where we do want the improvements is to come is 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 climate tolerance. I mean that's where we we can sometimes see an impact on on quality coming through from an unpredictable unpredictable climate, uh, and that will knock on effects of maybe how the some of the endosperm structures laid down if we've got very very dry hot dry conditions in in grain fill. Do we see a a more, you know, I think we think last a couple of years ago we saw quite a chaotic packing of endosperm cells because we did see some impacts on, on, on certainly on gelatinization and and other element, other aspects of some of the more esoteric things that we can measure. So I think that's something that we that we need to obviously look at. Yeah, that, no, that's, that's a big topic. Right, right, this is a very interesting question, actually. It's from Yoshi Shinoda. I hope I've pronounced that correctly. And this this will be interesting from a crisp perspective because I know you're in, I know you like you you you're in the heritage varieties market. So the question is: heritage varieties are very popular now for superior flavour brackets, supposedly. So the question is: what's the difference in the biochemistry which could lead to the difference in flavour, and how can that a different how, how and how does that is that impacted by the malting process? Hello, Shinoda San. Nice to have you on. Uh, difference in biochemical point of view. I didn't include it. I was going to put something in about flavor. We've looked at flavor uh, or volatile organic compounds, many of which have got flavor attributes associated to them. Uh, we've looked at them across varieties, and we do see varietal differences. Uh, <clears throat> and it seems to be a little bit more turbocharged in some of the heritage varieties. Uh, the differences, I, I'm not sure where they necessarily arise from. Some of them, I think, are more driven. Uh, you know, we see differences then in in some of our malting process. So, if we produce malt on our floor maltings, uh, which is very gentle kilning, long kilning, as opposed to our modern plants, then we do see some differences in flavour. Now, that could be because the Maillard reaction is being driven in a different direction. Because of the the extent of the of the kilning, also the very low air flows, so I think there is a there is really I think it's a variety times uh, process uh, equation to come up with those those final flavour attributes. 
Uh, and as it's obviously there's a lot of interest in trying to understand the origins of the flavour within the barley variety. We know that Marisotta, for example, gives a different flavour. Now, no one has yet been able to necessarily identify or isolate the genes, which the genes for Maris Otter flavour. People have crossbred Otter into other genetic backgrounds and they don't see that flavour coming coming through. So it may, you know, it may be a combination of factors, the way in which proteins are degraded through germination and then come through into the Maillard reaction uh, further into the uh, into the process. I don't, I'm not, I, yeah, I, that's a, it's a great question. It's a great area that everyone's showing a lot of interest in at the moment. So yeah, hops are the soul. Malt is the soul of beer. Hops are merely the lipstick on it. So <laughs> malt flavor rules okay. So you, you'll get away with that in this. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't, I wasn't expecting any hop merchants to be present. No. Okay. I've got a question here from Hailey, and Hailey, I see you on on screen, and uh, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but it's phenolic compounds solubilized during mashing. So why is why is phenolic esterase activity activity not a component of quality me uh, measure because the presence obviously leads to off flavors? Really fantastic question. I'm not sure I'm, <laughs> I'm going to be able to to fully answer it. Uh, no, we don't measure esterase activity, uh, and. <sighs> I guess part of the polyphenols are going to, you get removal of polyphenols through uh, latter stages of, 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 of processing. Uh, I mean, we've got varieties which haven't got any polyphenols in them, uh, and clearly they will contribute to, to off flavours, but uh, you need a better man than me to answer that one, I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. We've got no more questions in the chat. If anybody, we've got a chance for one or two more. Uh, we're going to finish at half past. Uh, I have got a question myself, which, uh, if you don't mind, David, I'll ask. No, ask away. Just, yeah, uh, something something uh, you haven't mentioned yet is the, the, the microflora of barley, because barley, I mean, particularly if you look at different agricultural practices, you've got a whole range of fungi, bacteria, and so on going into into a steep. Uh, in, in distilling, you've got no, you've got no, uh, boiling step, so effectively all of that can go and contribute to flavour in the uh, in, in 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 the stills, and it, and and in brewing there was a lot of discussion many years ago about beta glucanases from things like yeah. bacteria on the surface of the grain. So yeah. is, is that still a hot topic? But it, to a certain extent, I mean, I think you know people have described malting as a solid state fermentation process, uh, and you know it's not a sterile product, so it comes in with bugs on. You know we've got perfect conditions for microbial growth. It's wet, it's humid, it's warm. You know, you know you've got that opportunity for the bugs to go rampant if you, if they choose to. But uh, I mean, I think our, our predominant interest in microbiology of malt is more based around food safety aspects, ensuring that we haven't got any any nasties on the finished malt that could could come through into the um, into the final process. Uh, and I know, you know, there has been work looks done looking at sort of management of the microflora, you know, by changing malting, pro malting process conditions. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's quite possible that, you know, beta glucanase is coming out of exuded from certain microbial uh, populations which are present on the on the uh, on the grain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I've got one more question online, which I'm going to take, and then and then I think we'll close the session. And this question is: Are there acrylamide? Is there acrylamide accumulation during the malting process? Good question. Uh, not during what we would describe as pale malt production. So that would be standard brewers malt, distillers malt. There's well, having said that, there's a very small amount of acrylamide formation, but not significant. Where we do see acrylamide formation is when we go on to make speciality malts, uh, particularly crystal malt, uh, we can see formation of acrylamide, but acrylamide is relatively thermolabile. So there's like a color, if you like a color max for, for acrylamide, for max acrylamide levels after which we start to see a, see a deterioration. Uh, and it's managed, the acrylamide issue is managed by the brewers managed now by the distillers who are using coloured malts by a dilution effect. So, I mean, it's, it's less of a problem for the distillers, but for the brewers, because it's the coloured malts which contain the acrylamide might only be used at 10% of the grist, then uh, you know, by the time it gets through the brewing process and comes out into packaged beer, then 
the acrylamide level is 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 low enough not to be of concern. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah, and and I mean there are guidance and, and maximum levels in some products for acrylamide. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a topic which is uh, hot on our topics and one yeah. which we follow closely. Can, can be more of a problem with wheat malt going into the food industry. Uh, and I know that the, the, the group at Rothamsted are working hard to produce low, low asparaginase wheat varieties, uh, such that that, that minimises the uh, the risks in 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 baking and uh, and milling products. Yeah. Okay. We could we we could we could talk forever on this topic, and hopefully there'll be bigger opportunities to to do so. We, we've still got twenty three participants online, which is uh, a sign of. Well, I thank everybody for hanging in. <laughs> Yeah, so David, thanks very much for your time and, and I hope you enjoy that beer this evening. Thank you, I'm looking, I could do one now actually. So <laughs> Yeah, well you've got the you've got the open day on site. Yeah, I would I, I, I would I would make a, a plug for the next topic, uh which, which I don't know unfortunately, but there is a seminar in September. Keep, so watch the seminar uh, uh program on the IVH website and look out for your emails as well. There is an endeavour to put some more topics on, possibly between now and then. So this will, the, this will be a case of watching emails. And and a quick plug that Chris Malt have actually got some really good uh, seminar webinars on on your website. So anybody that wants to know more, yeah, please do. Yeah, open to yeah, open to everyone to to look at. So yeah, yeah. Thank, thanks for everybody for attending. And and don't and and don't forget you can go back and look at some of the other previous uh, web uh, seminars on the IBH website too. And I hope to see anybody that's there at Arable Scotland. <laughs>